there is no doubt that Nintendo are doing everything they can to minimise any use of their intellectual property, which they don't directly profit from. They state on their website that game piracy is illegal and they've even gone as far to run over shipments of bootleg Game Boy games with steamrollers while a creepy looking Mario costume figure looks on. And they also issue copyright strikes to any YouTube channels that have content they don't agree with or just don't like. Make sure you subscribe so you can see the videos before Nintendo takes them down. Nowadays, Nintendo's biggest copyright challenges come from ROM download websites and what they call copyright circumvention devices. But before we talk about those, let's have a look back at Nintendo's first piracy challenges. All the way back in 1987, Atari were secretly working to bypass Nintendo's security chip on the NES system. The chip itself was called the 10 NES and it worked to prevent unlicensed copies of games being played on the system. When Atari's engineers were unable to beat the chip using reverse engineering, they reached out to the United States Copyright Office who held a copy of the program so that Nintendo could copyright it, and they asked this office to send them a copy of the lockout program. They claimed they needed it for potential litigation against Nintendo. However, once they'd obtained a copy of the software and the, the diagrams of the chips and the schematics, they used this knowledge to create their own version of the 10 NES chip to fully unlock the NES. This allowed them to bypass all security measures. But why would a company like Atari want to hack the NES system? Why would they want to circumvent the 10 NES chip? Well, Atari were not happy with the licensing arrangement Nintendo were offering them. Nintendo were saying, look, you can only release five games a year, no more and any game you release for the NES system has to remain an NES Nintendo exclusive for a period of two years, no less. Because Atari were looking to port a lot of old Famicom games to the NES system, they weren't happy with these arrangements, they wanted no exclusivity, and they wanted to be able to release way more than five games a year. So they negotiated to try and get a better license, but Nintendo just weren't having it and said, look guys, these are the terms, take it or leave it. So instead, Atari said, no thank you, and they hacked the Nintendo security chip in 1989 and began releasing games for the NES system through a subsidiary of Atari known as TenGen. In total, 17 unlicensed games were released between 1989 and 1990. Since NES TenGen games were unlicensed and didn't have the Nintendo seal, Atari decided to give themselves their own seal, the 10 Gen Seal of Quality, which appeared on all their games. Nintendo were not happy. They stopped providing official Nintendo products to any retailer they found selling these 10 Gen games, and they also sued 10 Gen for copyright and patent infringement, and were successful, ultimately barring Atari from releasing any further NES games from March 1991, and forcing them to recall what was estimated to be hundreds of thousands of games. But I'm genuinely curious, do you guys side with Nintendo on this one or do you, do you side with Atari? Should we, or should publishing companies be allowed to release games for a system without having to meet what they deem as unfair restrictions by that owner of that system? If you own the printing press, do you get to decide what's printed in the news? It's a good question. Let me know your thoughts down below. So let's do one more story back in the day before we get onto the modern stuff of Nintendo going after anything they deem to be copyright infringement. And it actually takes us to video rental stores. You see, in the early 90s, it was commonplace to go into a video rental store and rent a copy of Super Mario 3 or, or any of your favourite NES games to take home and play over the weekend. Now, most of us wouldn't consider renting a game as game piracy or copyright infringement, but Nintendo see it differently. In the book Game Over, Nintendo's then Vice President, Howard Lincoln, is quoted as describing game rentals as commercial R-word, expanding that he expected to be compensated every time the thing sells. Now, not only did Nintendo not directly sell games to video rental stores to try and curb this, in addition, they requested all of their retailers not to sell any more than two copies of the same game to any one customer or groups of customers that walked in together in an attempt to stop and cut down on the supply chain for these video rental stores. But even that wasn't enough for Nintendo. They tried to address the issue in court by proposing legislation to the United States Senate in 1989 that would prohibit the rental of all computer software, including video games. However, luckily for us at the time, this bill was not supported. Now, Nintendo were not happy about this and they needed to find some way they could win this battle against the video rental stores. So unable to win the issue on copyright grounds and not allowing people to rent their product, they instead decided to sue the big one, Blockbuster, for photocopying their video game manuals. Now, this was a practice that was commonly taken at Blockbuster because of the amount of manuals that would get damaged or ripped as they were rented. However, yet again, the American legal system found in favour of Blockbuster, and Nintendo were forced to retreat with their tail between their legs. But that's all the past. That was the early 90s. 
I think you and I both know that Blockbuster are no longer Nintendo's biggest issue anymore and they're no longer running over copies of games and steam steamrollers. Their new issues, their new copyright issues come with ROM websites and circumvention devices and the companies that make and design these. In late 2013, two years after the release of the 3DS, a company called Gateway released the Gateway 3DS. This was a flashcard for the Nintendo system designed to allow you to play pirated copy of 3DS games via its inbuilt microSD slot. In 2017, the Stargate came out, improving on the Gateway 3DS. In 2018, less than a year after the release of the SNES Mini, the Classic 2 Magic released, allowing unlicensed copies of ROMs to be played on the system from its USB port. Also in 2018, a year after the release of the Nintendo Switch, the SX Pro released, allowing unlicensed ROMs to be played on the Nintendo console. Later, in 2019, the SX Core and the SX Lite mod chips were released, which circumvented security restrictions on post-June 2018 Nintendo Switch consoles and Switch Lite consoles, which had patched the original vulnerabilities. And what did all of these devices have in common? Well, although they tried to hide it by using aliases, every single one of these devices, every single one, was made by the same company, the same people, Team Executor. But the people behind Team Executor, they weren't just worried about creating the hardware required to run pirated games. They also were directly involved in the distribution of the ROMs themselves, using websites they secretly owned to distribute zip files containing hundreds of copies of unlicensed games. Their thinking being, if it was easy to get access to these ROMs, then you'd be more incentivized to buy their products to allow you to play them. And in 2020, three prominent members of Team Executor, Max Lurin, Gary Bowser and Yuaning Chen were charged in a federal indictment in the United States. At present, the only individual in the United States, Gary Bowser, has entered a plea deal that will see him pay $10 million to Nintendo. I can only imagine the amount of money Team Executor must be making at their peak for Nintendo to sue for $10 million and Gary to say, yeah, sure, I'll pay it, it's fine. And just for good measure, in May 2020, Nintendo also sued the owner of a website called ROM Universe, which allowed for illegal downloads of these games. And they won. They won $2.1 million against the defendant. However, the defendant involved agreed with Nintendo a repayment plan of $50 a month, and he's missed his first repayment. So it might take a little longer than the planned three and a half thousand years for Nintendo to get their money, if he ever lives that long. Nintendo are also going after individual sellers of what they consider to be copyright circumvention devices. The trouble is, you can use this device, the RCM loader, for all sorts of legitimate purposes on the Switch. And if you want to see what those are, you can click this video here. Things like running Android or watching videos on the Switch. Let me know in the comments down below, should these devices be illegal? The issue Nintendo will have is the same issue that any company will have trying to get rid of websites online. You shut down one, another one opens. You cut off the head of one beast and eight grow in its place. It seems to me there's only one solution to all of this. And that solution? Subscribe to the Rewire channel on YouTube.